Hey everyone, it's Jarrett, your favorite Canadian, and this week on Canada Explained, we're getting into the spooky spirit of Halloween by bringing you five ghost stories from across the country. But before I get started, I just wanted to take a second to thank all of you who've already joined us on this channel. There's 120 of you who have already subscribed, and as a new YouTube channel, that means a lot. We have to get to 1,000 before we can really start growing, and so having you already here, uh, coming to check out our videos every single week is, is really special to me. And for those of you who might not already be subscribed, consider doing it. Maybe leave a like down there or a comment on other topics you want to see in the future, because all of that really does help us out. But without any further ado, let's get into our five ghost stories from across Canada. The Halifax Citadel is a star-shaped fortress at the heart of Halifax, Nova Scotia. And at its center is the two-story Cavalier building. It's made of stone with its long veranda out front. The Citadel as it stands today is the fourth fortress to ever be on that spot. However, it was on November 14th, 1900, when a young woman named Cassie Allen waited at a nearby church for her fiancé to arrive. He was a soldier stationed up at the Citadel. Cassie waited for so long that eventually she decided to sit down in an old wooden chair and grew more and more anxious about the whereabouts of her groom. Eventually, they hear the sound of his horse and carriage approaching, and she jumps up to greet him, only to find the driver of the carriage with his hat held between his hands. Carrie's groom has taken his own life earlier that morning at the Citadel. She claps back into the chair at the news and couldn't believe what she was hearing. It had come to light that he was already married to another woman who was locked up in an asylum down in Bermuda, and I guess he just couldn't bear to live with the shame. Cassie's wails of grief could be heard throughout the city of Halifax that night. Cassie would go on to live another 50 years, and in that time the church was torn down, and that old chair? Well, it ended up at the welcome desk of the Cavalier Buildings Museum, where employees would sit to welcome guests. One day, while sitting in that exact same chair, an employee said that a young woman, dressed in a 19th century, grayish-white dress, stepped through the door, and the hallway suddenly filled with the scent of roses. The employee stood up to welcome her, but by the time he actually looked back up, she was gone. This employee would see her several more times while he was employed there. There was once he was thinking that it was a tourist that missed the closing time, but by the time he could actually approach her, she disappeared and others have seen her spirit staring through the window or disappearing around the corner of the building. This spirit is believed to be the ghost of Cassie Allen, the Grey Lady of the Cavalier. Clearly, the truth of what happened to her lover was too hard for her to accept, and her spirit is still searching the grounds of the Citadel for her beloved fiancé today. So if you're from Halifax or you've ever visited, have you seen the Grey Lady of the Cavalier walking around the Citadel, maybe staring at you through the windows? Let us know below. For nearly 200 years, the spirit of a young woman condemned for having killed her husband haunted travelers along the routes between Lévis and Quebec City. The lore behind La Carriveau grew and grew over the years, being the subject of countless tales and songs from Québécois folklore. As the story goes, La Carriveau was a killer. Between two and seven husbands she killed. An axe murderer, an expert in poisons, and once even a direct descendant of an infamous Parisian poisoner called La Voisin. She was executed a witch, and her body hung in chains for all passerbys to witness. Her tortured soul still haunts the old trails of Levy, a skeleton in a cage chasing weary travelers. One night, a well-known citizen was walking along the river when he felt a pair of bony hands wrap around his neck, and a ragged voice whisper, Take me to the river. He turned around and saw the cage, the red eyes, yellow teeth, and rotten flesh of La Corrivo. The story has some truth to it made all the more real to people by the discovery of La Corriveau's cage in a cemetery in 1850. But it's more legend than anything else. Marie-Joseph de Corriveau was born in the early months of 1733. The only surviving of 11 children, she was married to a Charles Bouchard at the age of 16. He dies 10 years later and she remarries to another farmer named Louis-Étienne Dodier. On the morning of January 27, 1763, Dodier's body was found dead in the barn with multiple wounds to his head. They said it was the horse that kicked him. He was quickly buried, but rumors started to spread. People knew that he wasn't on good terms with his wife. Her father was initially charged with the murder, and she was just an accomplice. But before her father hung, he confessed the truth. It was Marie-Josephite that had bludgeoned her husband with an axe. 
and his only crime was helping to cover it up. She admitted to the crime. She killed her husband because of how terribly he had treated her. And she was sentenced to hang, and for her body to hang in chains. That means being put up in display in a sort of body cage. La Corriveau was hung on April 18, 1763 in Quebec City, near Les Plaines d'Abraham. And her body was hung in this cage, at Point Levy, at the crossroads towards Lausanne and Bienville, located just where this red house stands today. Here, her body rotted for an entire month, and it wasn't long before the hauntings began. People knew not to take the river road that would lead past this place at night. Her eyes would glow red and her arms would reach out to grab you. Even after they took down her body and buried it in the cage, her spirit was said to rise from the grave and haunt those along these trails. So when they actually found the cage again in 1850, without a body, the stories of La Corriveau too came back from the grave, reawakening fantastic versions of the story that are still shared in regions around Quebec to this very day. Have you ever been told one of these stories? If so, let us know the version you've heard, maybe where you're from and where that story might have come from. I'd be quite interested. Before there was Winnipeg and before there was Manitoba, there were the Red River Trails. These were trade routes of ox cart roads that connected the Red River Colony and Fort Garry in British North America to the Mississippi River down in the United States. The land at the time was predominantly inhabited by Scottish settlers and Métis, who were disparagingly referred to as half-breeds from their First Nation and French dual ancestry. Lower Fort Garry, about 30 kilometers north of where Winnipeg stands today, was an important trading post on these Red River trails, and it was an important headquarters of the Northwest Mounted Rifles. One summer evening, in the wee hours of the night, a lone soldier was standing guard outside the gate to Lower Fort Garry, facing the Red River, when suddenly he saw something dark stepping through the mist down along the end of the trail. Then eventually he hears the sounds of clopping hooves, and he faintly saw an ox cart appearing from the gloom, driven by a Métis man and woman. The soldier thought that they looked a little outdated, but he shrugged it off and said nothing as the cart slowly crept by. However, just a few short minutes later, another dark form appeared in the distance, and it looked like it was the very same cart, driven by the very same man and woman. Confused, the soldier stared as it passed by, but the drivers paid no attention to him. The third time it appeared, the soldier began to shake and to sweat. He stepped out in front and ordered it to stop. No sooner does his order leave his lips, the cart disappears into the wind. Not a second later, it reappears again in the distance and then disappears again, appearing again closer and then further away. By now he's having a full-blown panic attack and he drops his rifle and runs back into the fort. He tells all of the other soldiers about what happened, and they laugh and they laugh at him. No one believes his story. A ghost cart glitching out on the river trail? The next evening, as the hours slipped into the night, another soldier came racing back into the fort, pale to the face, screaming of an ox cart haunting him on the trail. They too laughed at him. One by one, night after night, they all had the same experience, until there was no one left to laugh at. The story goes that the original inhabitants of the land, the Métis and their First Nations ancestors, resented the intrusion of the soldiers onto their lands, and they were making their displeasure severely felt. The gates in the walls of Lower Fort Garry still stand, and so too does the ox trail that haunted those soldiers. So if you're interested, you can go stand in the exact same spot and see if an ox cart might come mess with you too. Overlooking the north shore of Bennett Lake, across from the historic train station in Carcross, Yukon, is the 110-year-old Caribou Hotel. After the original hotel burnt down in 1908, this building was opened by Edwin and Bessie Gideon back in 1910. This is the oldest still-standing building in the entire Yukon, and being the first in for those coming north during the Klondike, it's definitely home to its fair share of wild characters and ghoulish guests that have yet to check out. There's a builder by the name of Mr. Simpson who finished the house for the Gideons back in 1910, and ever since, the new owners of the building have heard incessant hammering around in different rooms, almost as if Mr. Simpson isn't quite finished with the work that he had to do. Edwin and Bessie operated the hotel when it first opened in 1910 and kept on it for the rest of their lives. They welcomed a parrot back into the hotel in 1918, when the owner of a local mine asked them to take care of his pet parrot while he was away, before he drowned when the Princess Sophia sank later that year. 
Edwin died in 1925, and Bessie continued to operate the hotel until she passed in 1933. And this is when things start to get really weird. The hotel is said to be haunted by the spirit of a woman who often stands in a third floor window and bangs on the floorboards. Sometimes she knocks on guest doors and often appears in the room of some of the later hotel managers. It is believed that this spirit is the ghost of Bessie, who is described as being neither friendly nor unfriendly, but stays around to ensure that her hotel is being well cared for. It's said that Bessie was buried in Carcross, but her grave has never actually been found. Polly the parrot does have a grave in Carcross. He died in the hotel in 1972, almost 40 years after Bessie, and since then the woman in the window has appeared with a parrot on her shoulder. Miss Gideon still walks the halls of the Caribou Hotel. It stood abandoned for almost 30 years, but has since had a new lease on life. With a new restaurant and 11 guest rooms, this hotel was carefully remodeled to look exactly what it was like when it first opened back in 1910. And yes, the new owners do believe that it's Miss Gideon and Polly looking down on them from the third floor, just making sure that everything's in order. Have you ever been to the Yukon? Maybe you've checked out the Caribou Hotel in Carcross. What would your reaction be if you saw a parrot ghost staring at you from a window? Let me know down below. Gastown. Vancouver's historic district is well known for being one of the most haunted places in all of Canada. And what would be the most haunted building of them all? Well, some say that it's Vancouver's waterfront station. Built as the terminus for transcontinental trains from Toronto and Montreal in 1915, the building used to host restaurants, a dance hall, and even some part-time lodging for travelers in the East Wing. Today, security guards at Waterfront Station have witnessed a list of apparitions and poltergeist-like activities in and around the station. One night, a guard saw a young woman in a 1920s flapper dress dancing alone in a corridor. He could hear the music and the sounds from the 1920s playing, but when he approached her and asked what she was doing, the music stopped and she vanished. Another guard was walking alone on an upper floor of the East Wing. It had been used as residences in the past, but was now just abandoned or used for some storage. When he met a poltergeist-like entity. As he walked from room to room, a number of old desks moved together behind him without a sound. When he turned back to head the way he came, he realized that the only way out had been blocked by a dozen or so desks. He totally freaked out, leaped over the desks and ran from the room, quitting shortly after. But there's one more ghost that's more tied to the station than any other, and he's been seen by countless people, both in the station, on nearby tracks, and even walking around aimlessly in the streets of Gastown, especially on particularly rainy and gloomy nights. See, back in 1928, an unfortunate brakeman named Hub Clark was killed when he was making repairs in the rail yard just outside of the station. It was a dark and wet evening like so many in Vancouver but this time he slipped on a wet rail and was knocked unconscious. Horrifically, a passenger train came along and decapitated the unconscious brakeman. Since then, hundreds of people have reported seeing the headless brakeman roaming the tracks with his lantern in his hand, while others see him in different parts of nearby Gastown. What do you think? Do you think he's still on the job, or do you think he's looking around Gastown for his missing head? Nonetheless, thank you so much for checking out this video. I hope you guys like those ghost stories, and we'll see you next week. If you've made it all the way to the end of this video, it must mean that you enjoyed something here, so please leave a like down below, and if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. It does help us out a lot. And if you like these stories and like stories about Canada, maybe share them with your friends. I'm sure some of them might be interested too.